We are live. Welcome Yay. to Awakening Metaphysical Connections with Kelly and Gail. Again, I'm just going to check the Facebook group to make sure. Yep, we are live. We are live. Yay. If you have comments, please put them in. Or if you have questions while you're watching this, uh, we are here to answer all your metaphysical questions. So I know, Kelly, you said that there's been some interesting things happening for you this week. Yeah. Um, and it sort of is with awakening metaphysical connections, which is kind of why I wanted to talk about it here. Um, sometimes those connections that we have um, may be a little bit different than what we expect. A lot of times people think, you know, making connections, especially of a metaphysical nature, are always positive. And they're always, you know, love and light and everybody gets along and kumbaya and all that stuff. <laughs> and so often that is not the case. Um, the other day I was talking to a former coaching client who has become sort of a friend and she mentioned the whole soulmate thing. Everybody looking for their soulmate. And she was shocked by what I told her. A soulmate is not necessarily, you know, all um, love and light and love of your life and everything is beautiful and glorious. A soulmate connection will be your most usually traumatic lessons. And a soulmate doesn't necessarily um, mean it's going to be a romantic relationship. Uh, it can be a friendship. It can be an animal come into your life and teach you lessons. So we have a lot of misconceptions about what soulmates really are. Um, I believe, and not everyone shares this belief, but I believe we all have multiple soulmates depending on where we are on our own personal journey. Mm -hmm. Some people who are what I refer to as newbies on the planet <laughs> um, may go through their life with one because that's all that their soul is ready to learn. Mm -hmm. There are other people who the more ad advanced, I don't really like that word, but um, maybe the more, more lifetimes. Yes, the further along you are on your journey, your soul's journey, uh -huh. the more soulmates come in to test you. And, you know, sometimes we are very, very traumatized by those soulmates. And we don't understand, you know, because our conception as humans, a soulmate makes everything wonderful, right? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> so well, let, me, let me ask you this question, because I think this brings up an interesting question. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but this is where my mind goes. So there's soulmates, but then there's soul families. Yes. You know, and so it gets more convoluted because like some of the people who come into your life, you've traveled with for many lifetimes and you've all had different relationships. And then you start telling people about that and then they freak out yeah, you know, of what you were together in past lives and things like that. But it's really interesting. Like, you know, the fear to freedom group that this is posting on, I feel like I've probably had lifetimes with most of the people who are in that group. Yeah, definitely. You know, what, the, regardless of what my role was, some was more equal, some I was more of a teacher, some people I was actually the student. So it's just really interesting that, you know, we've formed this group because we're all supposed to do our work now and that right. we all need each other to do it. And so I think sometimes soul family can feel like soul mates. They can. And it depends on how many lifetimes mm -hmm. and what the relationships have been. I know I've known friends in this lifetime that I have absolutely 100% instantly recognized. Mm -hmm. I have known you before. Uh, we've been around together forever and ever. And usually they're surprised, <laughs> but, you know, um, it's, kind of the same thing as a soulmate but not really and you know you as soulmates are certainly part of your soul family mm -hmm. but they are 
they have more of a lesson to teach. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with a soul family, it's like you, you've got your squad, you know, you've, you've made, you, you have found your tribe and you have similar beliefs and similar likes and dislikes. And you, at least in my case, I can reach out and feel each member of my soul family mm -hmm. when they are thousands of miles away. Yeah. And I will talk to them, you know, days later. I do that with you all the time. Yes, I know. We do that all the time. And there are other people that I do that with too. And that is a soul family relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to realize, and I'm on the soulmate thing because of the relationship and the, and the, that this woman was talking about the other day. Um, and I think many, many, many people have a very wrong idea of what a soulmate is. Well, I think most people think of soulmate as your one great love. Right. And that's who you're supposed to find in this lifetime. And it sounds like kind of what you're saying is there's many different kinds of soulmates. Right. And it's mm -hmm. like being open to all those experiences and being open to learn all those lessons. I just want to welcome everyone who's watching us. If you have questions or topics you want us to talk about, put them in the comment section. We will be looking at them. Um, we didn't really have any questions before going in today. So we're just kind of talking about things that came up for us, you know, right. that we can lessons that we're both learning. Because I think the greatest thing that somebody can do with platforms like this is teach and yeah. help people to do their own work and learn their own way, whatever that's going to look like. Not all of us are going to learn in the same way. We're not going to get lessons in the same way. Right. Absolutely. Hi, Krista. Hi, Nicole. And I think it's Camilla who's on as well as the Facebook user. So yeah. hi and welcome. If you guys have any questions, let us know because we're sort of free-floating here. Yeah, you know, I'll just share. So as most of you know, and I talked about it on the Monday night readings. Hi, Nicole. Um, you know, I've had this thing going on. How about discussing ascension process? Ah. Mm -hmm. That's always a good one. I have had some really interesting experiences with ascension process. I used to draw it. So when did I go to opening to intuition in 2000? I used to draw ascension cones and I used to nice. draw what that was going to look like. Um, I used to know that the earth needed to get lighter, like we were going to have to lose a lot of souls on earth in order to make this jump to the fifth dimension. And I think that's what we're seeing now with all the natural disasters and flooding. Earth needs to, if you think about it, and I'll never forget when I got this information and you can tell me what you think about it, Kelly, is that, we have covered the earth with concrete, right? Yes. How can the earth breathe? Right. Like we killed all the rainforests. We've gotten rid of all the trees. We're like slowly dismantling things. And when you think about it, you wonder why so many people have asthma and stuff like that. Well, if the earth can't breathe, we can't breathe. Right. That's, so that's very true. I always think about that. And I'm always thrown back to that whenever something happens, you know. How do we get back into balance with the earth that we live on? She's a living, breathing thing. How do we become in balance with her? I, I think a lot of people misinterpret that as well. You know, there are so many misinterpretations. But one of the, in my, my what works for me, I'll say it that way. Um, I talk to Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, if you are a gardener at all, you can go out into your garden and you can intuitively determine what your plants need. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the earth itself. You know, she will tell you what she needs and what she's lacking, mm -hmm. but people don't slow down and shut up long enough to hear. And I really think that's what it comes down to is we're so busy trying to argue with what we should be doing that no one is listening. Mm -hmm. And if like, we would just listen. Yeah. I like this question. Do you think soul groups come together to heal collective trauma to help do the shadow work in order to evolve? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> when you consider how many lifetimes we have shared together mm -hmm. and how much trauma we have gone through together, mm -hmm. um, all of that has to be healed. That energy is still stuck. Mm -hmm. And we cannot move forward truly until we do heal that. I think that's why so many people are finding their soul families right now. I think maybe the other piece of this that we could talk a little bit about and tell me what you think about this is that we all create, like we write our soul contracts before we come in of what lessons we're going to work through and who's going to help us to work through those right. things like that. And I think sometimes we forget that we had a part in designing everything that we're actually going through now. Right. Sometimes I like to say, what was I at the end of the line? And there were no other choices. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you say, why, why in the world did I agree to that? I think then the other question becomes is how does free will then impact that? Right. And for me, the way that I interpret that is we've all agreed to learn these lessons. The free will comes in as which path are you going to take to learn those lessons? Right. We've built different pathways into how we can learn the lessons. So, I mean, that's how I think about it. What about yeah. For you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, I have had an interesting thing happen recently where like, many years ago, I had a very popular podcast with a friend mm -hmm. and um, she ended up becoming an alcoholic because of things that were going on in her life she wasn't dealing with. Um, she ended up stabbing me in the back and hurting me badly. Um, I will literally be paying for what she did for about the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. And recently in a meditation, I kept seeing the logo that we did for the show. Mm -hmm. And then the other day I got, I subscribed to a whole bunch of lists that promote various podcasts. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that podcast in five years. Mm -hmm. And yet three of our episodes were on that must listen to list. Hmm. And I went, well, that's weird. So I reached out and said, what in the world's going on with this? Oh, we don't know it's computer generated with how many listeners uh, any particular shows have. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning out of the blue, she called and said, hey, how many times can I apologize for what I did? What do you think about our show? So we are going to be rebooting that show. If for no other reason, then I feel we probably had more things to work through. As we go through our lives, and if you think about it, you'll realize it's happened to every one of us. There is a catalyst in our lives. When we are not making the change and not listening and not going down the path the universe, God, Shira, whoever you want to subscribe to, you know, wants us to go down. There will be a catalyst that will maybe force us to make decisions we weren't ready to make. Mm -hmm. And if you look back on it years later, it was absolutely because we were being stubborn. You know, I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble in my life thinking I knew better than God. <laughs> You know, yeah, I know you want me to do that, but I'm not going that way. I'm, I'm going to do this over here. And, you know, it <clears throat> trauma is a funny thing. There are all kinds of traumas. Uh, mm -hmm. Betrayal trauma is one of the big ones. Anytime someone we love and care about betrays us, that cuts to our soul. Mm -hmm. You know, that is absolutely a horrible, horrible thing. And to be able to go back and heal that and look at it and really try to understand the lesson behind it. It's a really, really valuable experience. So really somebody posted um, different soul groups have a different focus, intention, shared collective in different areas of work, the collective feel attunement, like an orchestra that we are trying to align with. While we still live in separation, dualism, we are trying to transcend the will to just say, F it, 
and do what we know <laughs> is not an alignment listening. It's a process. It's now yep. speeding up. We are working through trauma faster than ever before. Absolutely. So yep. So true. And it feels like the lessons are coming faster and faster too. So it's like, you better be ready. Because right. like, as soon as you're done with one, the next one is like smacking you in the face. And, you know, and I think that, I think one, thank you for sharing that story with your friend, you know, and I'm sure it took a lot for you to want to do that podcast again, you know, yeah. and to get, <laughs> obviously how much growth that you've had to be able to do that. I mean, I think that that's really cool. And I have to say, you know, and I've talked about this before. I think I talked about it last week on here and I've talked about it with you that I don't know what it was, but out of all the podcasts I did when, you know, I wrote all the books in the beginning, I always felt the most comfortable with you. And like I would go places that I never thought that I would discuss in public forums and it would just all come spilling out. And that's a gift that you have that you give all of us that ability to make us feel comfortable and do this work and want to share and want to open up. And I think I'm not sure why I'm telling you this on air, but it's, it's really important. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's very nice of you to say. I um, it was a process. Mm -hmm. um, I have generally my entire life been a very forgiving person, mm -hmm. and I do believe people can change and people can be redeemed. And the main thing that I got from reconnecting with this particular person is what she did that hurt not only me but several other people, made her stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And maybe that was a big part of it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe you guys were the, you know, the catalyst for her being able to do that work. Right. And I think it works both ways. Hmm. That's an interesting question. How do we know that we are on the right path with one soul contract? Mm -hmm. What do you think? How do we know? Because if we're not, we get pushed in the direction that we need to go. I don't, stop pushing you. I don't know how many times like I'll try and do something and it'll be like, nope. And usually when you're on the soul path, everything is very synchronistic. Right. Like it always just seems to work out and then the next thing happens and the next thing happens. Like I know, for example, we've talked about doing this for like a year. Yeah. And it was just never the right time. And then two weeks ago, right. it was the right time and everything lined up and it's pretty easy and effortless. And we're, I, well, I know I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. You know, I, I am in a dark room today because my lights burned out and I was chasing a horse right before we got on. So I'm kind of sticky, but you know, it's still fun. You know, it's and I think, I think it's just about showing up. Yeah. How do you want to show up? How, you know, I think about, you know, we were talking about drinking a little yeah. earlier. And that, for me, I love energy and I love chakras and I love explaining things from that point of view. So I'm, I have a feeling most of our listeners are probably familiar with chakras and what they mean. But my favorite experience that I ever had with my spirit team, and it's in one of the, I think it's in the eating disorder book that I wrote. I don't know. But they gave me a lecture on primary colors, which yeah. I thought was fascinating in that when we think about chakras, so for those of you who don't know really quickly, they're red, orange, yellow, green or pink, sometimes turquoise and gold for the heart chakra, um, light blue, indigo blue, and purple, silver, or white for the crown chakra. Different cultures believe that one's different colors. Now, when you really think about it, so let's take an example. What do blue and yellow make? Green. <laughs> blue and yellow make green. So right. if you're not balanced in your intuition or your voice and your power, your heart's not going to be open. Right. And then what do red and yellow make? Right. Orange, Orange right? right? So if you haven't dealt with your tribal beliefs or survival issues and you're not in your power, you can't be who you're meant to be in the world. And so it's really cool when you start thinking about it in that way and combining those things. And most people with addictions 
are blo and most people with trauma and early developmental trauma. Sorry, the therapist part of me is coming out. <laughs> blocked in their first three. Right. Trauma is your root chakra. It's all about survival. You have no idea who you are or how to be in the world when you've had a lot of trauma and you feel like you have no sense of power. Right. So to work through trauma, you really need to work through those three chakras. Right. Does that make sense to all our listeners? That was my deep thought for this evening. When I was a therapist, they used to say deep thoughts by Gary. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like to do is combine Reiki with color and sound. And if you combine that together, it helps people, it seems in my experience, to help people work through that um, better. I'm sort of the queen of trauma. <laughs> it's um, so because of that, I'm just mentioning others. <laughs> I worked with people uh, who had been traumatized, particularly battered women, mm -hmm. for a very long time. And I would go into shelters and set up treatment, and I would have you know, visualization of different colors as I was doing Reiki up the chakras. And then I would um, use sound mm -hmm. as well. And they found that very helpful. So even when we're working on ourselves, you can do that. I mean, you can find pure tones even on YouTube for free these days, which I find amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, don't underestimate layering right. things when you're working through stuff. Well, when I one of my favorite healing modalities that I ever took was arch healing, which was ancient rainbow conscious healing because it was sound, frequency, and vibration all together. Right. And I really liked that. Um, yeah. Kelly, at some point I have to connect you with Camilla because you both do work with horses, and I think that you guys could really connect. So okay. I will send you both a message in Facebook together so you guys okay. can connect. Yeah. Yeah. I think that you guys would be, um, yeah, yeah, um, there, so someone said there's also a seven year developmental phase with the chakras, which is true, but the way that I like to think about it, and I forgot what class, it might have been the arch class too, the way that the teacher at the time explained it, is there's seven layers to each chakra. So you have every issue in each chakra. Right. So let's say we're talking about your power chakra. There's still the tribal beliefs in part of that. There's still the who you are in the world in your power chakra. There's still the heart in the heart. So I think it's really cool when you really start to like look at things from like, you know, and this doesn't go well as a therapist, you know, <laughs> yeah, traditional therapy. Um, because you need to balance everything and you need to balance the etheric and the auric levels and everything together. So it's not right. just talking. Right. So, right. yeah, so that's my two cents and my little soapbox moment. <laughs> what other questions do you guys want us to talk about tonight? We're open to discussing anything. So. And we have reached silence. I know. Silence is never a good thing when you're on the air. Um, one of the other things that I've kind of been looking into lately mm -hmm. is different sounds and the effect that it has on our outlook. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking particularly, I've been um, playing around with recording drum sounds with flute and, you know, key and that kind of stuff. But I know several people who listen to very, very different kinds of music. Um, chanting mm -hmm. has always made me feel like it raises your vibration. Mm -hmm. But there are other things like heavy metal, um, some rap. Um, mm -hmm. I have been known to have rap playing while I'm cleaning my house, full disclosure. But generally speaking, the more you listen to what is essentially negative energy, really, um, the more it has an impact on your life. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen that in well, your practice? 
I have. One of the things that I always used to talk with the clients about is when they were depressed, they would always listen to depressing music. I'm right. like, it's going to keep you stuck in your depression. But it's it's cathartic because I relate to it. You know, it's saying what I can't say. And again, it keeps you stuck. Right. I do listening to the opposite. So if you're sad, listen to something happy. You know, in right. DBT, there's the opposite to emotion action. You want to do the opposite of what you're feeling in order to pull you out of it. So I used to tell people, this used to get me in trouble too. I'm like, okay, you want to have a pity party? Let's do it upright. I'll get the black balloons, the black wedding, <laughs> the black streamers. Let's just really throw it, wallow in it for a while, and then you need to come out of it. Right. right. I used to get in so much trouble for that one. <laughs> yeah, I um, I was a therapist for a very brief period of time um, because I found I was a better healer, not under the therapy banner. Mm -hmm. um, when I, I, would, I, say I died, would agree with that, actually. Yeah. You know, when I died, um, nothing I, I didn't even want to go back into my office mm -hmm. I was like no 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 I've learned a better way I can't do this anymore mm -hmm. and um, I've kind of stuck with it ever since I have a lot of friends who are therapists mm -hmm. and a few of them scold me <laughs> frequently like I, body symptoms that's a good one I just want to end this part with this is one of my favorite ways to explain it to the clients because I my favorite movie growing up was Willy Wonka. <laughs> you know, I didn't want the golden egg or things like that. I wanted an Oompa Loompa to play with because I thought they were fun. Um, but let's say we have the Wonka Vader, right? And they press every button in the Wonka Vader except the one. And you have to and you can't go sideways and byways and diagonal ways. The only way out is through, right? You have to go through the things that you don't want to go through. And at the end of the movie, it demonstrates that where they press the button and they have to gain enough speed to crash through the glass ceiling so they don't right. get ripped to shreds. And that's very much what recovery and working through trauma feels like. You're going to have to crash through that glass ceiling to have that 360 degree view that you don't currently have. Yep. So, um, want to read the light body symptoms? Question. Soul and spirit are able to access the new energetically coming through, but physical body taking time to catch up, throwing up lots of, ex yeah, exhaustion. <coughs> I'm going to have a coughing fit now, so maybe okay. you should. Know. So I will go ahead and talk. Um, you know, I think that as all the new energies come down, one, it depends how sensitive you are to the energy. Some people feel them right away and are feeling it while it's <laughs> happening. For other people, it can take a couple days. What I always encourage people to do is to just be kind to yourself. It is going to take a little bit of time. Sometimes going into a meditation too. Um, I had this teacher, okay, I had this teacher in arch healing, not arch healing, in angelic healing fire. There's a meditation where we did where you separate your physical body from your light body. Your physical body stays with Archangel Raphael to heal it and get it to where it needs to go. Your light body goes up a little bit higher to get to where it needs to go. And then when they come back together, they're in perfect alignment. So even thinking about what that looks like for you, how do you get your physical body and your light body and your soul into alignment? And sometimes it's having conversations with your higher self. Well, thanks, Janelle, that you love the analogy with the elevator and the ceiling. Um, so that's kind of my take on um, as energies change. I know for myself, there's some days where I just have a weird headache all day and I can't break through it. Sometimes the energy makes me what I like to call a little manic. It's just like I get these spurts of energy and this just wave of creativity that I can't stop or shut off. So I think it just is starting to be aware of how it affects you. And I think that that's the important part. 
Yeah, I think surrendering, taking a nap, meditating, and again, talking to your higher self and saying, I need this to be into align, to be all brought into alignment, asking your guides to help you bring it all into alignment. We can ask for help. So I think that that's all important to do. You know, my, my favorite analogy, since you like the analogy, the elevator, and we're waiting for um, Kelly to come back. My favorite analogy that I used to use all the time was from the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. In the movie, um, Sean Connery plays his father who gets shot. And so Indiana Jones has to cross these two chasms and believe that there's an invisible bridge to get him from one side to the other, <laughs> get the Holy Grail to save Sean Connery. And I think that that's so much of what life is. We're here and everything we want is over here, but we don't trust that there's really gonna be a bridge. And we have to take what's you know known as that leap of faith. And like, if you go to any treatment centers, I always find it fascinating because they always have pictures of bridges. <laughs> like most treatment centers I've worked in always have a bridge of some sort somewhere in the offices. Because that's really the journey is taking that leap of faith, getting on that bridge. You can't tippy toe, you can't throw stuff down. You just have to jump and believe it's going to get you to where you need to go. That leap of faith is so important. <coughs> so, Kathy, is there anything you wanted to add about the light body symptoms or surrendering into it? <coughs> No, you do have to surrender, though. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we fight it. I want to do it my way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so. I, sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, obviously, maybe there's something you need to say, clearing your throat. Maybe something's coming up if we look at the throat chakra. You know, maybe there's something you need to talk about or you want to say. I'm always a firm believer when something like that happens. It's because maybe we need to do something we don't want to do. And, you know. Yeah, like and it could be because I'm allergic to horses. Mm -hmm. And I have seven of them. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, that could pose a problem. <laughs> I um, made the decision very long time ago that. Um, I would just take whatever needed me. Mm -hmm. And occasionally I have people, well, where I live, people are not good to animals mm -hmm. at all. And it drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. So frequently I end up rescuing animals mm -hmm. and uh, even the ones I'm allergic to. So. Okay. Does, Today was worst day. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions or any other topics you can, want us to talk about? <coughs> you know, I, and I was telling this story the other night. So everyone knows that I've had issues with my new car. <laughs> and um, on Labor Day, I called the car dealership and asked to speak to the general manager. And I, I got a voicemail, which I knew I was going to get. And I said, you know, I'd really like a call back on Tuesday after the holiday. And I wasn't yelling. I wasn't screaming. Although, God, I really, really wanted to. I really wanted to unload <laughs> that on somebody like all this angst from the last nine months of dealing with all this stupidity from them i really just wanted to like yell and at some on some level i knew that wasn't going to get me where i wanted to go like this uh sales service director said to me thank you for not yelling thank you for being rational i really thought this conversation was going to go a different way and because of that so what's today so the car was still leaking a little bit of oil so i called them yesterday no yeah yesterday and they got my car in today. They got me a loaner car, which they always tell me they never have any. Right. And um, and they're keeping it overnight to make sure that there's still not a problem in the morning. Because I'm like usually after it sits a while is when the problem's happening. So and this, I heard the service director tell the guy, you know, who writes the car up. Even if this takes two to three days, she's keeping that loaner car 
and we are not going to say a word. <laughs> we are just going to fix this. So, yay. Yeah. Kill them with kindness, I guess. Sometimes yep. I still, my human self has a really hard time with that. My soul self and my higher self don't. Like, right. You know, I, I mean, I was in a situation where I was bullied in a job for years. And everyone would be like, well, why, when she, you know, why are you still nice to her? Because, and I'd be like, well, if she's doing this to me, how much pain does she have to be in? Yep. That it's coming out at all these people. And so I always still had compassion for her. Yeah. You know, and I stayed in the situation for four years because then I also um, managed it so that my coworkers didn't get it. Like she would only have one target at a time. So I was it for a really long time, but um, it's just interesting, you know, like everyone would be like, why aren't you screaming and yelling about it? And even there then, I mean, I got angry afterwards when I left. I got really angry about the situation, but at the time I'm just like, just look at the pain. Like, if, you're right. And sometimes when you're really intuitive and I don't know how you feel about this, Kelly, but when you're really intuitive, you see beyond the bullshit and you see the soul. And so it's really hard because yeah. you sometimes don't see stuff coming at you because you just see the good naturedness of the person's soul. And you don't sometimes see the bullshit that goes on. Excuse yep. me. Which Absolutely. From the human self. Yeah. Sometimes we I want to talk a little bit about anger because we can really derail ourselves. Uh, either misdirecting anger or not getting to the bottom of it and healing it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the a lot of the trauma that we go through is kind of of our own making. If if we don't um, deal with things as they come up, sometimes we're so busy seeing that person's soul and and how wonderful and beautiful they are that we overlook things we shouldn't overlook. Mm -hmm. And it just builds and builds and builds and builds. And we can make ourselves sick like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then there's the flip side of sometimes we can be really spontaneous. You know, what kinds of things do you do? Like when your soul saying, do this, do this, like just call in sick today. Just, right. you know, and then sometimes we're so responsible, we don't do it. And sometimes it's really important to listen to that call because yeah. you don't know what your soul had meant for you or what you're going to gain from that experience but sometimes i know for myself sometimes i have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility yeah. you know and sometimes i feel responsible for all of humanity so, <laughs> yep we've had this conversation before. Yep, we have <laughs> and um you know because i can see things maybe a little differently than other people can and i see when things are coming and sometimes I try and help humanity not have to go through it. Right. And I think that sometimes, just sometimes having fun and playing and doing spontaneous things is sometimes what we need. Yep. So. Yep. It's like somebody did that today. Yes. Went to the beach. <laughs> I yeah, remember yeah. when I could drive to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I was just telling Kelly before, so my car is in the shop again. Hopefully they fix it. But I have this um, fully loaded um, Jeep Grand Cherokee loaner car. So I may go for a little bit of a joy ride later. I think you should. To, to play around. And uh, I don't normally do that, but I'm like, oh, today it seems I might just go take it on a trip. Yep. I don't have a destination in mind. I might just go for a ride. But. So over responsibility was me. I'm now so mm -hmm. listening better and following my heart. And again, it's about listening to those nudges and things like that. Like uh, the story I always used to tell is when I worked at one of my other jobs, I had two ways I could go home. Um, I could either stay on the one highway, which was I-90, or I could get off at 294 because I lived sort of between the two. And I would always hear, get off at 294, and I'd be looking <laughs> down on I-90, and it'd be like, ah, it's not so bad. <laughs> and then I'd be stuck in traffic for hours. So finally, after I don't know how many times, I'm like, when I heard get off, I would get off the highway. Yeah. yeah so. 
I, that's that's an important point though we need to listen to that inner voice more than we do mm -hmm. you know i know when i was living in san francisco parking was a big problem uh -huh. and uh i had gone to the uh it's either a theater no it was an op it was an opera and um I, a friend of mine was driving and she parked and i went don't park there mm -hmm. and she said well what do you mean it's a parking space like, yes, but it's right next to the dumpster. Don't park there. She mm -hmm. says, what is this thing with you in the dumpster? So I decided I'm not going to argue with her. And we went and came back out four hours later, and somebody had dropped the dumpster on the front of her car. And she said, how did you know that was going to happen? It's like, just you listen to those voices. They'll keep you out of trouble a lot. Yeah. All right. The um, <laughs> come to Cincy. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be driving to Cincinnati tonight. I have to work all day tomorrow. Listening to your inner voice is fantastic. It's the getting others to listen to you when your inner voice states something. <laughs> I think my way around that is I try not to tell people anything. I ask them questions instead. Mm, make so it there again. If I am getting some information, I'm like, well, how would you feel if this happened? Or do you have any sense that, like, let's use your car, where you parked your car is a bad thing? Like, just tune in for a minute and see if you get anything from it. So I'll try and use it more like teaching opportunities. Although I do get messages all the time for people when I'm out, but I'm not like Teresa Caputo. I don't go around right. <laughs> what the messages are. Once in a great while, they'll be like, no, you really need to. Right. It's like a friend of a friend. So I'll say to my friend, um, you think it'd be okay if I said this, you know? Right. So it's just really interesting. So. One of the things that happens when people are just waking up to their abilities uh -huh. is they kind of go overboard. And that Teresa Caputo person uh, reminds me of, of that. I've seen that in my own practices and coaching where people will finally start hearing, mm -hmm. they'll finally start paying attention. And then they feel like it is their job to fix everyone around them. And it's, it's annoying to me, but usually I just laugh at it because it's just like, it's like a toddler stumbling, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just kind of cute. They're learning, but <laughs> it is kind of annoying after. I once had an intern who um, I was at the hospital, so we would start at like 7.30 in the morning, our shifts, and she was so cheerful. It's like <laughs> none of us could take her. So about the third weekend, I'm like, can you dial it down about 10 notches first thing in the morning? The rest of us aren't there. <laughs> and she's like, I'm part of the team. You're telling me what's wrong. <laughs> Take it however you want. I'm just telling you that we all think you're annoying. Right, right. <laughs> so, all right. I think that um, we've answered a lot of questions. I think we've been on for about 45 minutes. Okay. So I, we can keep going if people have other questions, but um, I think this might be a good place to kind of yeah. wrap it up for this evening. Yeah. We covered a lot of ground, actually. We seem to every week. I know. It's for people who don't really know what we're going to talk about. We seem to always talk about it. <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah, we don't seem to be at a loss. And I'm just waiting for us to have a couple episodes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put them up on YouTube. Yep. Um, and we'll create a YouTube page called Awakening Metaphysical Connections with Kelly and Gail. And then we'll put all the episodes there. So, you know, if you don't, you don't have access to the Facebook group, you can still see them. Yeah. So we're going to do that. But we thought we'd have a few more before we do that because one looks lonely. So probably after next week, maybe after our third one. Third, yeah, that, that feels right. I'll put them up there because I like things in threes and fives. Yeah. All right, everybody, have a blessed rest of your evening. Apparently, I'm going for some kind of joyride in a little while. <laughs> Come to Arizona. Arizona.
and make more ways than one. I might be driving the car, but I might be feeling joyful while driving the car. So um, everybody have a great evening, and we will see you same time next week. Yep. Bye, everybody. Bye.